uh, to take us through the housekeeping and I was then going to suggest as it's a hybrid meeting we have a roll call just to check to see who's online and who's actually in the room. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Today, some members are joining the chamber and others via Teams. A reminder to all remote participants to please keep your camera and microphone switched off during the meeting, unless you are speaking, in which case you can switch off your microphone and camera on as well. If remote participants wish to speak, please use the raise your hand function. A function to all the public section of this meeting is being recorded and published online for public access after the meeting. If members and officers could ensure that their microphones are at the correct height and when speaking, you should speak into the microphone as directly as possible. This would assist with the sound quality on the recording. I will now ask members participating today to confirm their attendance once their name has been announced so that this is clear in recording of the meeting and can also be recorded in the minute. Chair? Present. Councillor Gregg? Present. Councillor MacDonald? Present. Councillor Radley? Present. Angela Scott? Present. Kate Steven? Neil Cowie, Caroline Hickscott, Luan Grijan, Hi, present. Kay Yoen, Gordon McDougall, Jonathan Smith, Alistair Robertson, present. Professor Pete Edwards, present. Duncan Cockburn. Present. Matthew Lockley. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, well, welcome uh, to this meeting. Um, we obviously have uh, a couple of new members uh, who are joining us uh, today. I just wondered if it would be helpful to go around the room uh, just to give everybody a chance to put names to faces. Uh, you do all look different when I'm not seeing you, just that uh, top half only. Um, some people are obviously a lot taller than I thought they were, um, but that's life. Um, I'll start with myself. Uh, my name's Alec Nicholl. I'm a councillor with Aberdeen City Council, and I'm one of the co-leaders of the new partnership uh, that was just elected back in May. If we would maybe like to go round the room clockwise, and then we'll go to our colleagues online. Uh, I'm Martin Gregg. I'm a member of the City Council. Um, I'm the chair of the Education Committee. Um, and I've been involved in community planning um, all, all the time that I've been on the council, which is now 19 years. So I have a great enthusiasm and a great ad admiration for the community planning project. Thank you. Hi, I'm Councillor Miranda Radley. Um, I'm convener of operational delivery and deputy leader of the SNP group on the council. Hello everyone, I'm Sandra MacDonald. I uh, represent the um, inner city ward of George Street Harbour and I'm the Labour lead uh, uh, for the, the Labour group here in Aberdeen City Council. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Kirsty McLaughlin. I'm the operations manager for Elevator, so I look after business gateway support in Aberdeen City and Shire. Uh, good afternoon everyone, I'm Pete Edwards. I'm Vice Principal for Regional Engagement at the University of Aberdeen, and I'm responsible for all aspects of civic strategy for the university. Hi, my name's Alison McLeod. I'm Strategy and Transformation Lead with Aberdeen City Health and Social Care Partnership, and I'm here today just to present the uh, IGB's uh, strategy. Hi, Alice Robertson, actually with Sports Aberdeen, but today I'm representing the Active Aberdeen Partnership and the Sport and Physical Activity Sector. 
Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Derek McGowan, I'm a Chief Officer for the City Council and I chair the Anti-Poverty and Community Justice Groups for Community Planning, Aberdeen. Good afternoon, I'm Area Commander Che Ewing, the Local Senior Officer for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Good afternoon, my name is Brian Nelson, I'm a Station Commander with Scottish Fire and Rescue. I'm here this afternoon to deliver a case study on behalf of Group Commander Andrew Dick linked to stretch outcome 10.3, reducing wildfires. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Stephen Shaw, Aberdeen City Council's Environmental Manager, and I'm here this afternoon to talk through my report. Thank you. Angela Scott, Chief Executive Aberdeen City Council. Sorry, we've got four apologies for this meeting. Apologies from Gil BT, Richard McCullum, Paul O'Connor and Susan Webb. And I am Google Oka for the clerk for the meeting as well. Sorry, can I get the people on Teams to introduce themselves, please? You wish to put on your camera and microphone so people in the chambers can see you, please. I'll go first. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Gordon McDougall. I'm Head of Operations with Skills Development Scotland. Hi, I'll go next. Um, Luanne Grujon. I'm here in my capacity as Chair of Aberdeen Integration Joint Board. Hi, my name is L Lavina Massey. I'm uh, substituting for Jonathan Smith, who's had to go on business to London. So I am um, going to do my best and on behalf of the Civic Forum, on which I have am vice chair. Hello, my name is Duncan Coburn and I'm the vice principal for strategy and planning at Robert Gordon University. Hello, I'm Phil Mackey. I'm the Public Health Lead for the Aberdeen City Health and Social Care Partnership and here representing Susan Webb, whose apologies you've just noted. I'm Simon Rayner. I'm the Alcohol and Drug Partnership Lead for Aberdeen City here to talk to one of the case studies this afternoon. And hello, uh, I'm David Milne from Scottish Government. I'm here to speak to a paper on place directors. And I'll also cover for Richard McCallum, who's the Scottish Government Place Director for Aberdeen. And uh, as Google mentioned, he sent apologies for today. OK, thank you very much, everybody. Um, obviously, uh, welcome to the, the new people and to people who are substituting. Um, with the welcomes, uh, there obviously follows a, a, a valedictory for Gordon McDougall, who is with Skills Development Scotland. This is going to be his last meeting. Um, just so that you know a little bit about Gordon, he's been a member of the Community Planning Aberdeen Board since February 2017. And he's the head of operations for Skills Development Scotland, covering the northeast of Scotland. Uh, Gordon has been a, an active and committed board member and has helped mobilise uh, the SDS staff resource to supply priority improvement aims within the LOIP, which has been greatly appreciated. Uh, in particular, the leadership so, shown by SDS in chairing the city's economic outcome improvement group, Aberdeen Prospers. Uh, Gordon has also played a leading role uh, that SDS staff continue to play in many of our LOIP improvement projects from skills and training, developing the young workforce and supporting our most vulnerable members of society to get into employment, uh, education or training. Gordon will be missed by his peers as he's an enthusiastic collaborator, vocal contributor and passionate believer in what can be achieved by working together. On behalf of Community Planning Aberdeen, I'd like to wish him all the best in his retirement. Thank you. Thank you. If, if I may, Chair, just to say thank you for those kind words. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to miss everybody. Um, you know, it's been a great partnership. Um, the work will obviously go on with my successor. So um, just to say thank you. Uh, uh, 
really enjoyed my time and uh, I, I, I wish the partnership continued success. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving to the business uh, for today. Um, do we have any declarations of interest? I'm not seeing anybody and I'm not seeing any hand. Levina, is that a hand? No, no it's a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> it took me okay. so long to get into this meeting. I've never had to wait about 15 minutes to get into Teams before. I've been to several Teams meetings. So I can just, it's a recuperative cup of tea. <laughs> I'm glad you're organised. That's that's absolutely excellent. OK, item 1.1 is the board minute of the 20th of April 2022 for approval. First of all, are there any uh, matters arising from the minute? I'm not seeing any hands. Can we agree the minute? Yep. Okay, that is agreed. Um, there is the draft management group minute of the 1st of June 2022 for information. Has anybody got any matters arising from it? Not seeing any hands. Uh, that takes us then to item 1.3, the board forward planner at pages 23 and 24. Does anyone have any questions on the planner? Not seeing any hands, so we'll move on. 1.4, the national update, uh, and I think David Milne, who's attending virtually, is going to give us a verbal update. David, over to you. Sure. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I'll I'll keep this short. I I, I suppose probably the. The thing to update most of all is a kind of from a Scottish government perspective is a kind of reaffirmation of the priorities a government Scottish government has um, for what we do very much uh, continuing around uh, tackling child poverty in line with the updated child poverty uh, reduction plan from March tackling uh, well, supporting COVID recovery uh, in line with the strategy published last October. Uh, the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, so very much about supporting, invigorating our economy, but with uh, green ambitions and fair work and uh, 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 social outcomes very much at its heart too, which again was published in in March and also on constitutional matters. So those four themes were very much at the heart of the resource spending review, which uh, Scottish Government published uh, at the end of May. And what that really does, it's the first kind of multi-year view that uh, Scottish Government has published in over a decade. Just And really what it does is just trying to provide a bit more of a stable platform that allows a bit more um, sustainable planning and anticipation of uh, uh, how resources are best used in line with uh, these priorities and with a clear kind of focus as well on how we deal with the cost of living crisis and against the continuing backdrop where public services are under great pressure and also our resources are under uh, great pressure. So that those principles will continue to feed through into um, ongoing work and the next real, I suppose, milestone from a government perspective will be the programme for government, which uh, ministers will announce at the beginning of September. Parliament is now in recess, but that is the next big ticket item. I mentioned constitution as one of the big themes and obviously uh, members will be familiar with uh, the recent announcements about uh, uh, a second uh, independence referendum. But that aside, maybe one thing worth highlighting is something which features in the resource spending review announcement, which is uh, government working with COSLA to develop a, a new deal for local government. So building on <clears throat> um, 
the work that's already taken place on the local governance review and really just trying to reset and uh, embolden the kind of positive relationship between local government and central government, but with an eye including on uh, fiscal framework and fiscal powers, but also functional uh, uh, scope for flexibilities uh, for local government and kind of resetting that relationship. Um, so I think I'll just leave it at that just now, but if anyone has any questions, I'll, uh, yeah, I can answer. Thank you very much for that. Uh, questions for David? Lavina, have you got a question? Thanks. Well, it's such a broad remit. And yes, I find it difficult for one person having to deal with this. I presume there's a team behind it all. Uh, yes, uh, the, th the um, thing I think is th that um, lots of people are talking about is the cost of living crisis, the fuel, the heating of the homes and the feeding, and feeding of their children. Um, and they're also concerned with a new independence referendum coming along. I think a lot of people are feeling we're a bit of, we don't know where we are, <laughs> if that makes sense. So yes, I, I've taken some notes on all the things that, that um, Mr. Milne was pointing out that, that, that were high on the agenda with the Scottish government. And I think that's all very good, yes. And the more that's done to ease people's mind and get back into work and get their life into a better routine again, that's all to the good. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Lavina. I'm I'm not sure if some of that was a question rather than a statement. No, I'm sorry, yes, it, it, it didn't come as a question. It was because of all the things that, that he has listed, I'm thinking they're all good to be working on and, and I hope the COSLA and, and the, the government work together with quickly to work through things and if necessary, come back to the local authorities and the communities to, you know, question proposals um, and and uh, helpful things that could come back from the, the people, you know. Yeah, it's amazing. I found through being, when I was working, uh, you know, well, being paid to work, uh, I was a scientific civil service and, and I was one of the UK delegates to what's now called OSCOM. Uh, and I was one of the people who helped to set up the rules and regs for the, the oil companies coming to work in the North Sea. So, and then after that, I retired and I thought, don't let the grey cells die. Get into the community side of things and help people with all the expertise I have learned through my working life. So, yes, and I'm glad to see that there's a broad spectrum of problems that the government are looking to tackle. Uh, and, and things that should be prioritised on that, and I hope that will be. I'm still not coming up with a question. I'm sorry. I think I'll stop at that and let the meeting get on. Thank you very much. The sage words come what may. Uh, I've got Councillor MacDonald. Thanks. Uh, to, to be honest, um, Chair, mine is probably a more of a comment than a question as well. And um, I was uh, last night um, at... Uh, uh, um, Chamber of Commerce event with um, the Cabinet Secretary, um, Kate Forbes. And, um, it, you know, one of the takeaways that I took from that was she was very clear um, that uh, the success of Scotland is very much going to be about how successful the economy is here in the North East. And um, so that was... <laughs> That was most pleasing um, to hear because it is something that um, that we, you know, I think we would all agree is 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 the, is the case. I think what was um, probably, you know, it's, it's about sometimes about what's not said as well, and and I think um, there is. Um, you know, there is a genuine, uh, as Levina also mentioned, um, you know, concerns in the North East, not just about the, the cost of living crisis, um, but about about stability. And I think, um, you know, if there's one thing I heard from Mr. Milne, it was about having a stable platform. And I know it's a bit of an oxymoron for me, but having a stable platform and a second independence referendum looming um, is not somewhere that I feel um, comfortable with. And I think you know, having been through that and, and you know, other... Um, 
um, political maelstroms, um, um, it is so, it is of some concern. But I guess at the end of the day, um, what, what I really wanted to say was that, that the New Deal, um, you know, for local government might well be um, something that we that we that we can um, we can work towards. But we also need to mention those things that are perhaps not being said about, um, you know, the the. Um, the, the, w the way that the National Care Service is shaping up and what that might mean also for um, local government and for our communities. And at the end of the day, all of us in this room are about, um, you know, making sure that we that we plan for and deliver for those communities. And so um, I, I think it's very helpful to have this on the agenda. And I'm sure it's something that'll, that is on every agenda that, that we'll come back to. So uh, thank you for that uh, report. And I'll, I'll look forward to seeing how those four top um, priorities um, um, are delivered in the same way that there were five that the cabinet secretary had last last night that she had in her portfolio to deliver as well. So um, I think there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of focus on that going forward. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Milne? Not seeing any hands. Okay, we'll move on to 1.5, which uh, is the paper role of Scottish Government place directors. It's again Mr Milne. Mr Milne, do you want to introduce this before I ask for questions? Thank you, convener. Uh, I'll, I'll keep this short, um, but maybe just kind of building a bridge with the uh, uh, comments that have been made so far. Uh, First of all, from the councillor, I guess the place director role is, is part of the package about how uh, we within government want to build, if you like, a constructive uh, relationship and how with, uh, with local partners understand what's happening locally and actually respond to what's happening uh, locally as, as, uh, as well. And just then quickly in response to Lavina's comment uh, i realized that probably when i was speaking before i was speaking probably quite typically bureaucratic terms uh for which i apologize but ultimately okay. the reason any of us are here is because we want to do the best we can for for people and that's that's true regardless of you know where, where we are uh, in the system and i think what lavina brought out were some of the real challenges that uh, so many people are facing here and you're right government policy nationally will play a role in that but actually so too are locally created and evolving approaches and the way in which communities are involved very much in from the outset of of uh, what we do and that um and that public services are shaped around really what matters to people particularly those whose needs are greatest so that's a, a slight kind of segue into a um, discussion with the place director role, which hopefully the paper itself is is reasonably clear. It's intended to be uh, really a kind of continuation of the location director role that uh, Scottish Government had previously with uh, CPP areas across Scotland. Um, and, but um, if you like, uh, re um, um, uh, so, sort of rebuilt uh, as we come out of uh, the, the COVID re recovery situation. So more impetus given to it, a bit of a, a shift in emphasis so that with taking account of, as well as purely local priorities, how issues of common interest nationally and locally are, are played through. Um, and I guess as well, maybe what's of particular relevance uh, within Aberdeen will be actually how we frame this and, and build that relationship. Two points to make there. First uh, is that the Scot uh, place director is a bridge between local area and other parts of Scottish government. So uh, they will not be expected to be the font of knowledge and everything, but they can make connections into other parts of the org organisation. But secondly, it's part of a corporate responsibility across government to listen to and to engage with and um, and build approaches together with uh, those who are working closer to the front line so that it, um, it is not simply government nationally, if you like, cascading out expectations. Uh, it's very much uh, with with true partnership 
uh, in mind. Um, I'll leave it there. I'm conscious that we got really good, helpful feedback uh, from the Chief Executive uh, of Aberdeen City Council uh, back in January. And there's something I think really important uh, which she brought out at that stage about having a kind of really constructive, really mature relationship between uh, governments, national and local. And I think that's something that uh, we'll really be uh, keen to build on and actually looking for ideas about how we do that as well as saying how, how we do that. Thank you very much, Mr Milne. Any questions on that? Not seeing any hands. Thank you very much. We'll move on in that case to item 2.1, Aberdeen City Integrated Joint Board Strategic Plan for 2022 to 2025. Um, Ms McLeod, uh, you wanting to introduce the paper, please? Thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. The uh, IJB's uh, strategic plan was approved at the meeting on the 7th of June, um, but we brought it here uh, today to, to share it with you. I think um, some of you may have, have seen it already. Um, there are three versions of the plan. and um, We have our full version um, with the delivery plan uh, as an appendix. Um, we have a summary version, which um, is aimed at uh, people who might not uh, wish to, to trawl through uh, as much detail as we've provided in the full version. Um, and we have an easy read version for uh, people who who might have difficulty understanding uh, some of the language. Um, we're also in the middle of preparing an animation um, which we will use to to launch the plan once um, it has made its way through all of our, our sort of governance and awareness processes. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight in terms of the, the plan was the development process. Um, we started with this back in uh, about March uh, 2021. Um, when we were working alongside colleagues, community planning colleagues in uh, relation to refreshing the local outcome improvement plan and developing the locality plans. Um, we also worked with our colleagues in NHS Grampian um, alongside them when they were developing their plan for the future, which they've just launched this week as well. Um, in addition to um, our own uh, consultation, etc. So the uh, result of all that, that work is the plan um, that you see in front of you today. Um, we've obviously taken in, uh, into account the strategic context, um, a, a key feature of that being uh, the uh, National Care Service, which uh, the bill for which was uh, introduced just um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, one of the reasons why we have developed uh, a detailed delivery plan uh, to sit alongside the strategic plan is so that uh, it helps us maintain our focus on what it is that we as a partnership and an IJB need to do um, whilst uh, all of the, the conversations around the, the National Care Service are ongoing. Um, the plan basically recognises that challenge um, around about uh, demand and capacity. Um, and the impact of, of, of what we're not now calling the three C's, COVID, cost of living and climate change. Um, the impact that they have um, on what was e existing inequality in, in the system. Um, we're also committed to um, improving uh, our services being rights based um, and making best use of, of our resources. So we have our, our four aims and we have our, our, our enablers. Um, we've agreed that we will um, refresh the delivery plan aspect of that um, on an annual uh, basis. Um, and we've agreed a, a reporting process to uh, through our senior leadership team um, and our committees and our IGB. Um, our annual report obviously uh, will um, demonstrate our progress uh, on a, a public basis. Um, so I think that's really all I wanted to say in terms of the, the plan. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, please?
Mr Scott. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Nicholson. It's not a question, Mrs McLeod. <laughs> I was just curious about, um, given that we've got Alistair Robertson here representing the Active Sports Partnership, now that we've got the strategic plan refresh where you've got a real emphasis around good health, whether it, it would be useful at some point, Alistair, for the partnership to hear the full range of what's going on under the banner of Active Aberdeen Sports Partnership so we can see the contribution that's that's being made because that's a critical part of the shift to prevention isn't it so it's not a question i guess it's just a a request and I, i'm interested to, to to hear i just wondered if there was an opportunity to encourage alistair to share a wee bit more about what's going on at a future meeting uh, excuse me i'd welcome that because i think we've been talking particularly recently about the recovery and the intervention that sport and physical activity can play as part of supporting the people and communities. So I think a really good tie up. Happy to see if we can set that up. Okay, I've seen, seen nodding heads there. Uh, be very happy to be part of that. I think that's a very important uh, aspect to the work that's going on. Any other questions? Councillor MacDonald. Thank you, Chair. Um, huge bit of work. Um, uh, um, re really good to to see everything uh, laid out here, and and the um, the way that's been communicated at various um, different events has been has that has been, has been really good too. I do note, um, you know, some of the um, you know we're, we're not progressing on some of the national uh, indicators as well as as we we would want to do. And my question really is around threats and and and. You know what? What do you feel might be the biggest threat or threats um, to delivering um, this plan over the next three years um, that that we need to to look out for? Thanks. So, alongside our strategic plan, we also have our strategic risk register. Um, so that's where we 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 capture. Um, the a number of, of, of uh, concerns as to to, to what might um, limit the 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 delivery and um, and we also consider uh, mitigations there. Um, but I would say um, if you're asking me to to to, to pinpoint one because um, we do have ten uh, risks on our register, um, I think it's probably around about resources. Um, you know that there's a, a great will from um, the staff within the partnership and the the members of the the IJB to make this work and to do the best that we can um, for for the people of Aberdeen. Um, but we are always limited by um, our resources, by our staff, um, by our, the, the finances, and we just we you know we continually have to to look at ways that we can make the best use of that um, staff working differently, uh, transforming services so that we can deliver the same or, or more with um, the the same or less uh, resources. So I think that's uh, that 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 juggling act. Is, is going to keep us all um, very well occupied over the, the next three years. Thank you. Do you want to come back on that? No, that was that was a, a fulsome answer and, um, and, and one I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to as, as time moves on. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any hands. Sorry, uh, Sorry, Luan, I'm told you've got a question. Thanks. Thank you. More, more just a comment and, and building on Councillor MacDonald's um, point there. I, I suppose what we're really keen on at the IJB is that we have a very clear strategy and that we're intent on delivering it over the next three years, um, whilst we recognise the National Care Service is, is coming on the horizon. So our plan is sort of to deliver what's in the strategy, but also to prepare for the National Care Service um, so that the work we're doing takes us in the right direction. So that the Feely report had 53 recommendations in it, one of which was a National Care Service, but there were 52 other areas for um, integration joint boards to consider. So our strategy is absolutely focused on delivering things for people in Aberdeen over the next three years, whilst absolutely doing the, the necessary preparations for the National Care Service um, as that comes comes closer and also influencing um, what's 
what the National Care Service is going to focus on because we have really good examples of good practice and success in Aberdeen around what we've already delivered um, through Aberdeen Health and Social Care Partnership. Thank you very much for that. Anybody else? Not seeing any more hands and I'm not seeing anything online. Um, yeah. Oh, Lavina, are you wanting to come in? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, what what I was wanting to see was, I would um, ask government to maybe give the uh, local uh, health service a little bit more funding, because I find because I att attend uh, one or two outpatient clinics, being an old wifey now, uh, and and I find that they're absolutely. Um, have an entrepreneurial spirit in order to deliver things. Now, well, that's good if they can still keep up their spirits as well, because uh, it's very necessary that, the, that uh, I suppose it's looking back at their health, mental health care as well. They can deliver things very well, a little differently from other parts of Britain and Scotland even. Uh, and and uh, yes, I would like to see a little bit of encouragement given by a little bit more funding. And I think that that, that this is uh, maybe I'm preaching to the converted of the local authority, but not to maybe the the, the government in Edinburgh. Thank you very much, Lavina. I think we all appreciate more funding. I I certainly do. Uh, do you want to come back on that, Mrs. McLeod? I'm not going to make any more uh, any comment on uh, Scottish government fu funding or more of that. But what what I would like to comment on is um, staff health health and wellbeing. Um, absolutely, I think that's a a a, a, a very pertinent point. Um, and I think I would just like to uh, assure everyone that uh, staff health and wellbeing is very much at the forefront of our considerations. Um, we are del delivering as much as we can to ensure. Um, that, that staff are looked after and we, that we listen to staff needs. Um, but the development of our workforce plan, um, which is under development at, at, at the minute, and we, we hope to be uh, submitting it uh, by the end of, uh, of the month, um, the, that is very much focused on uh, looking after our staff, um, not only the staff that are here and that turn up and do the job, um, but also looking at how can we uh, create, give our staff that more capacity? What can we do? Um, what more creative things can we do in terms of uh, recruitment and retention um, and the skill mix uh, that we use uh, to support everyone to be able to, to deliver the services that we need to? Thank you. Yeah, Any... I suppose, so, sorry, do you want to come back in, Lavina? Thanks. Yeah, I was just uh, what wanted to say that as somebody who is no longer in the working uh, public anymore, I feel that I can have a, a, a little bit of authority from the community side to say that we are, we are pleased to see what is done for us, but we know that from attending clinics, doctors, whatever, or having people come into our home to help look after us, we feel that maybe just a little bit more help on the financial side uh, is something that I can talk about, but people who are in the local authority, either as a councillor or as an employed person, can't do it. So I was being a bit cheeky there, perhaps, in, in bringing it up. But I think that, that the government should really take in mind that, you know, everybody needs to have enough to keep everything going as we've been talking about. And I apologise if you think I'm being over the score. Not at all, not at all. Uh, and, and you are still working because you're here at this committee. So there you go. Any more questions on this paper? Not seeing any hands. The recommendation is on page 35 to note the ambitions of the IGB strategic plan and confirm support for delivery over the next two years. Can we agree? Yeah. Thank you. Um, moving on, item 2.2, uh, the LOIP annual outcome improvement report. Uh, Mrs. Swanson. Thanks, Chair. 
Members have before them the annual report for 21-22, but this also provides a reflection on where we are at in this at this point in the 10-year local outcome improvement plan. So the report highlights what we've achieved so far with our headline achievements, and in there you can see that we are evidencing that four of our stretch outcomes have been achieved, and that's really testament to the commitment of our partners and our communities to partnership working. But the report also provides an assessment of our overall progress towards the 15 stretch outcomes now that we're more than halfway through the 10 year plan. It also recognises and highlights that there are other areas where we still need to achieve and that we need to continue with our improvement and move at pace to ensure that we're sustaining the improvements that we've highlighted, as well as achieving the remaining stretch outcomes and improvement aims we set out to achieve. Finally, I just wanted to highlight that a development plan was produced to support the implementation and delivery of our refreshed LOIP and locality plans. So at Appendix 2 to the report, you can see the current progress status of the improvement actions contained within that plan. Thank you very much. Questions from Mr Swanson, please? I'm not seeing any hands. I, I've I've got a couple of uh, small questions. Um, one of the recommendations is to have a, an easy read version uh, made available. Is is that going to be an abridged version of some kind, or what, what's that format? It going to take, please. At the start of the annual report, you'll see that there's a summary section, so it's intended that the public easy read version will be in aligned with that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. The the, the second question I have is uh, obviously, um, you know, we've gone through in the last couple of years absolutely unprecedented times, and you know we've made great progress um, to do with this, um, and you know we're seeing today you know, four achieve, achievements being reached. Um, I, I wonder if you could provide some comment on how valuable it might be to have a look back over our shoulder, uh, given what's happened in the last two years and where some of the projects are in terms of we've maybe identified an issue, but that that has exponentially grown over the, the, the last two years. And are we still correctly focused on it? And, you know, for things that we've achieved, are they in danger of creeping back to being something that is once again something that needs our attention? Um, if that makes sense. Um, I wonder if we could maybe just have a little commentary in around that. Certainly. In terms of the improvement aims that we've achieved, we always have our quarterly report where, although they've been achieved, we'll still report in terms of the overall aim trend to ensure that that's continuing until we get to the point of the refresh. Also, our annual report next year will give us that chance to show that the sustained improvement in terms of those um, four stretch outcomes that have been achieved have had that that has been sustained. So we will do that. And you've seen in the project end reports later on today's agenda, we say in there that the data in relation to the overall aim will be continue to be recorded and reported on. Mr Scott? I, I probably heard your question slightly different than, than Ms Swanson heard it and, and, and everything that Alison said is absolutely valid. I heard your kind of challenge around in terms of the population need um, and how that's been affected by COVID, by cost of living. And if memory serves me and Alison will correct me, we'd, we have done a check-in <clears throat> as we've been refreshing to just keep making sure that what we're committing to in the LOIP is still relevant based on present day population need assessment. So I think as we did the refresh, we did that check. But I think that was probably Councillor Nicholl before the cost of living that's come in. So I think it was it was during the pandemic. So I think it's a good challenge for us to think about. And of course, if we are successful with our HDRC bid, and I'm just looking at colleagues from the university, if we are successful there, then this might be a piece of work that we can do through the HDRC. But in the event that we're not successful, then I'm looking to Phil Mackey, who's representing the Director of Public Health. That may be a piece of work that the direct, um, Phil Mackey can do with Director of Commissioning 
just in looking at the current data on the cost of living impact and making sure that the LOIP has picked up any further issues from, from there. But that's what I heard your kind of question was coming from that, but have I misunderstood? Absolutely not. No, I, I was hopefully trying to ride two horses with my question. Uh, and, and I think that would be really, really helpful because I, I, I think we're far from out of the woods yet uh, in terms of where we are. Um, we've gone through COVID, but we've now run into all sorts of cost of living uh, problems. Uh, and I take it no further than that. But, you know, we only need to look at the cost of to put a litre of fuel in a car. Um, it's going to present a big problem for some time to come. Uh, and I think that's going to impact on many, many more people than we had previously envisaged. So I, I do think that would be a, an interesting look back over our shoulder uh, to see where we are. I noticed that Phil's popped up on the screen and he may want to say something. And I know that we've got Derek here who chairs the anti-poverty group. So it might just be worth asking Phil and Derek to, to add some commentary too. I'm happy to go first. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Um, the first thing to say is, yes, that is work that's already uh, within line of sight and scoped. And in fact, Derek and I have had a preliminary conversation and are looking to firm that up. I think what I would say is understanding the problem is one thing. But this group needs to be considering active solutions rather than simply uh, enumerating the size of the problem. And that is certainly an area where I'm looking at what evidence there is. Recognising that many of the uh, sources of evidence predate the current cost of living challenges that we face. So we will have to exercise a degree of judgment and good old fashioned professional chutzpah, if I can use the term, to see how we do that intervention. Thank you very much for that. Do you want to come in? Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, they, I agree with Phil. We had a discussion last week to to try and understand this. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking. And Angel asked about the uh, needs assessment, the strategic needs assessment, and um, as as we know, some of the national data on poverty rates, etc., isn't available. So there's a, a lack of reliability there. So I think, you know, Phil's point about, you know, professional knowledge and expertise and, and I think lived experience as well is going to be important here to do that. So certainly something we're aware of and, and working on. Um, but I can't really add to, to, to what Phil said at that point at the moment, but I'm sure we'll be back before you um, updating you on that. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's just I feel that um, while we don't have the data in front of us, because the data always has a time lag to get to us, uh, I think common sense tells us that there is a, a growing issue out there. How, how big it will become, I, I do not know. But uh, I think, you know, going by our own experiences, it's probably going to be quite an impact. And it, I think it would just be kind of helpful if we did manage to have that we look over our shoulder to see if there's a problem coming that we haven't actually incorporated at this point in time into our plans. Why, why don't we try and rise to your challenge as a set of officers and maybe do a combination of some hard data and qualitative data and some lived experience data as well? And I think um, I think Phil's right between the the analysis of the data and then doing it, I guess our sense would be that the LOIP probably does cover all of those touch points of vulnerability. So whether that's food, fuel and, and so on. <clears throat> so our probably our professional sense is that all of those points of vulnerability are either addressed through the LOIP as a collective or they're being addressed in some of our individual institutional plans. But you're right, there's a unique combination that's going on, which none of us have probably seen in any of our lifetimes. I think we should just remain curious about what hard data we can access and what some of that softer data is in order to understand the concurrency point, which is your point, the vulnerability that folk were still feeling from pandemic 
and now we've moved into a cost of living. And of course, we don't know how long mm -hmm. the cost of living crisis could could last. So, so I think let's we'll take your challenge and we'll try and bring a kind of combination of um, data back um, appropriately nuanced, and then we'll we'll try and look at that against uh, all those aspects that are in the current loop and take sort of Phil's steer around if there's anything extra. But I do think it, I mean, genuinely it does link to the proposal on the HDRC that, that that's the capability that we're looking to build as a as a partnership. So so we'll get as far as we can and then the clever people in the HDRC, if we're successful in getting that bid, can can do the harder bits of the work, Councillor Nicola, if, if that's okay. Thank you very much indeed for that. Has uh, Councillor uh, Greg for a question. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree that it's a it's a very challenging and unpredictable and confusing environment out there. So um, further analysis along those lines will be very helpful. But I, th I think I mean we're seeing overall um, a generally improving landscape um, through through this report, um, although it's varied. There, are, there, you know, there are. There are real, real signs that can give us some hope, and and I think that one of the reasons for that is that we've got some very imaginative thinking going on. Um, we've got um, innovations such as e such as um, EBZ Works, which I think is help is helping to make that crucial difference, um, and that that's having impacts on the on the economy section, on the young people section. So it, it it's that empowering um, people, um, allowing the leadership to. To happen and to flourish um, at the you know at the operational level that I think is helping to um, produce strong cultural changes and is helping us to really make that difference that we need to see. Um, so more of that um, I think would we would probably all welcome. Thanks. Thank you, and I've got Luan. Um, thank you. Just to say, yeah, really supportive of of what's been discussed and 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 the plan. My my suggestion or what what I'm thinking is it might not be that we need new um, new targets or new areas, but we might want to have a um, a stronger focus on areas of the loop that we already have in place. So, for example, the living wage employers. Maybe we could have a really big impact if we set. Uh, more targets around how many employers we want to have as living wage employers, you know, in the next year or, or, or things like that. So it's maybe just about looking at the current LOIP priorities and which ones maybe we need to give extra focus to. I would be worried if we started talking about adding more because I think there's already a lot of uh, a lot in the LOIP. So it's just a comment, but really supportive of what's been proposed. Thank you. Uh, if, if I can just say, uh, I wasn't hoping to add anything <laughs> to the existing light uh, and, and I would agree with you I think if we maybe pick out some of the key factors uh, within the loop and, and actually just hone in on them to see where we actually are uh, as a society uh, I don't know if Mr Scott wants to come back in on that happy happy to do that I think we can cluster all of the suggestions that have come from the discussion and try and play that 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 back to you. It may not be too polished, uh, and uh, and Mrs. Beatty will reprimand me for for tasking her in her in her absence. But happy for 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 a number of colleagues to come together and try and um, share something back with the the partnership at our next meeting. Thank you very much. Have we any more questions or comments, Levina? Oh, sorry, I've got Alistair Robertson. Thanks. I've got a few. <clears throat> comments just to appreciate they may not be completely linked but the first one was whether there was any evidence that the alignment of the locality management between CPA and IGB was having a positive impact if somebody could maybe give us some thought on that Mrs Swanson do you want to try sorry could you repeat that again Alistair about the um, the alignment of the localities uh, the decision between uh, IGB to align with the CPA localities, well, that was having a positive impact on delivery of outcomes. Yeah, our um, locality inclusion managers and our public health coordinators are currently in ongoing in that piece of work and developing the annual reports for our localities. So that would should come to our next meeting. Um, so we would see that at that time. Thanks. Well, I think it's a very good report, very positive. But I wondered whether 
the sustainability and capacity that's going to be required going forward um, is realistic given certainly in our sector huge huge gaps in, in staff and challenges of working and different uh, differently at the moment whether that was was having an impact on um, the delivery of some of the charters and the outcome we have a reporting process for all of our charters where they're providing us with monthly updates and as part of that process we ask the project teams to highlight any risks and issues that they're facing so that that can be taken to their outcome improvement group in the first instance and then up to the management group and board where they are being escalated because we recognise that resources um, and capacity could be a challenge so hoping that through that mechanism that they'll be highlighting any issues that we can have them discussed at the earliest opportunity so that we can overcome them and provide the support needed to take those um, projects forward. Thank you. One just, a, I suppose, a word of thanks for the illustrations in page 48 to, to 50 to, to give us an indication of the key people. It's been really helpful to see who's behind what, uh, since we've not seen many people for the last couple of years reacquainting with familiar faces. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Any further questions or comments? Yeah, um, I, I, I had my hand raised. I, I don't know if it's still up. It's Lena here. I, what I wanted to add was that that we have to look at the data and things like that and see if we need to re-examine just as, as Angela Scott was saying emphasis on how we are going to deliver some things uh, with the concerns within the communities not on, on their only on their health whether they still got a job the need of change of jobs from the oil and gas industry to the the uh, more natural industries that the offshore wind and things like that as a, as a as an, an example so there's lots of concerns for the people in the communities at the moment, personally and, you know, and as groups within the thing. And, and I, I think that we are usually really working together on this as far as possible. But uh, yes, I would welcome uh, the, to, uh, a real look at some of the uh, projects that we have in the LOIP to see if we need to maybe do more with them, not tie them up yet. Because I know that we would get more volunteers coming from the various localities if we empowered them a little bit more and say, look, this is a project. We hope to do it within what, three years, five years, whatever. And then you take it over and keep it going in your community for everybody's benefit. And I think that was how community planning actually started out when I was back when I first retired and was involved in the setting up of community planning Aberdeen. So, yes, I'm agreeing with what most being said today. And I think that's coming from a community voice. Thank you very much for that. I'm not seeing any more hands. So with that, um, there were Four recommendations, and I've obviously thrown in a challenge uh, to Mrs. Scott. <laughs> um, so, can can we agree that? Uh, and unless anybody's got anything else, agreed. Thank you. Um, moving on to item three point one, the CPA Improvement Program Quarterly Report. Um, Mrs. Swanson, do you? Yeah, I'll just introduce this before handing over to our project managers who are here to speak to the case studies. So it's our usual overview of progress of the 75 improvement aims within the improvement programme. So 72 of the aims are now live and um, those projects are progressing and you can see that we have a project ragging against each of them to reflect on whether the projects are on track or at risk. And as I said earlier, that enables us to highlight those issues at the earliest opportunity to enable those to be discussed and supported. We have three charters that are still outstanding. Two of those were due to today's meeting, um, but they have been postponed as detailed at paragraph 5.2 of your pack. And they will now come to the August management group meeting and the board meeting in September with the board's approval today. 
We have seven improvement aims that have been achieved and three of those have project end reports on today's agenda, whilst the other four projects are still continuing to ensure that their improvement has been sustained and working on their project end reports. And we have the project managers here to talk to those project ends later in today's agenda. Finally, we have three case studies with the project managers here to talk through the changes they've tested, the outcomes that they're achieving to date, as well as any barriers that they're needing support with. Um, and on that, if there are no questions, um, I'm happy to hand over to project managers. Thank you. Before we go to the project managers, is there any questions for Mrs Swanson? I'm not seeing any hands, so with that, um, can we go to Ms McLaughlin, um, who is going to tell us about supporting unemployed people start a business? Thank you very much. Yeah, so my name is Kirsten McLaughlin and I'm the operations manager at Elevator. So my day to day role is looking after business gateway services, which we deliver in Aberdeen City and Shire. So overall, our goal is to help people start up a business. Um, and so we've been involved in Aberdeen Prospers and different charters to support the LOIP for the past four years. So our current charter aims to support people in the city um, who are on universal credit to start a business. And our goal is to help connect them with relevant partners for funding. And there's a particular focus on the locality areas, but we do cover all of the city. When speaking about starting a business, um, we very much are speaking on the micro size of uh, businesses. So we're talking about somebody taking their hobby and turning it into a business, be that setting up home baking, be that carpet fitting, joinery, um, dog walking, pet services, that sort of thing. But it's to help people move into being more independent in their lives. So working within the locality areas through the ideas that we've been trialing, we do see um, higher barriers than we maybe would see elsewhere. Um, and three of those main struggles are around confidence in people to start up a business and take that plunge. It's a lonely place. Um, connections. So they maybe don't know anybody else who's launched their own business. Um, they don't feel like they have a network in place. Um, and then inevitably uh, funding and finance. So having the resources to, to take that step. Um, so, so far with our charter, we've had really good progress um, and success with our change ideas. We've trialed seed funds for um, in collaboration with ABZ Works. So to support young people start a business, to help um, parents um, and, you know, had good referrals through those routes. Um, we've introduced a community business advisor who is on the ground more on a day to day basis, which is really great because we've not normally had the capacity to do that. Um, and we also have more, just generally more engagement with our partners, the job centre, the DWP. Um, so overall, that's led. Um, we've had 47 inquiries so far from people on universal credit that are interested in starting up a business. Um, obviously, through our services, we've had a lot more than that. But this is specifically on the, the city centre and people on universal credit. I would say the community business advisor has been our biggest success. So we worked that into our current business gateway, uh, our new business gateway contract, which started in April 2022. Um, and this allows us to have a business advisor in each of the localities twice a month um, to support people on the ground. So more regular than we've ever been able to have the capacity to do so before. Um, it will take a bit of time to see the impact of that coming through in the numbers because people don't come to us and say, I'm starting my business tomorrow. It takes a few months to build the confidence and build the, the knowledge before they'll take that plunge. Um, but the, our community business advisor is building connections, planning mini workshops more in the locality areas so they don't have to come out to us, um, facilitating drop in sessions and, and, and that sort of stuff. So some really great um, engagement going on there um, and they've been in post for three months. So we'll see that build. Uh, we had a really great case, case study with Carly Stewart, as you can see. So Carly Stewart, um, you can see, came to us. She'd been made unemployed. Um, she was a qualified beauty therapist, so wanted to consider starting up her own business. Um, so, so through her business advisor, through working with her on her confidence and getting some seed funding from the city council, um, she has set up her own beauty therapy business and is building that. I think she's moved into a premises. It's not her own premise, but I think she's taking space and a premises so that's great for the city centre as well. I suppose um, challenges in the future of the charter so there's always going to be a resource issue it's been mentioned a few times in other areas today so in Business Gateway Aberdeen we have three dedicated startup advisors and one community business advisor 
um, to, to, cut, to support startups in all of Aberdeen City and Shire. So four people in total um, for the wider region. Um, and we have found that when we're supporting people through this project, um, they do require a little bit more support. Um, I suppose the normal parameters of Business Gateway is that startup is a one-to-many support service, whereas, of course, people in, in these areas that, um, you know, to go for the seed funding need to look at having a business plan in some form of financial um, plan and a funding justification. That takes a bit more time with our business advisors to be able to sit down with them, chat through what they need to do and support them in that way. Um, I suppose generally, um, you know, the support is always welcome to spread the message of what we can help with. A lot of people don't know where to turn. So, you know, knowing the breadth of Business Gateway support and then what can feed into this chart is, is really um, appreciated and support from our partners to achieve our aims. But overall, I think we're, we're quite optimistic, particularly as we're now beyond COVID restrictions and, and that sort of mm -hmm. stuff, that um, we're making good progress um, and we'll, you know, we'll continue to see the numbers trickling through. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, questions for Ms McLaughlin? Councillor MacDonald. Thank you um, for, um, for for giving that further information and, and talking us through it. I, I wondered, um, we've got the geographical spread of um, the individuals starting the businesses um, in front of us in your, your one page report. And I just wondered if there were any other um, stats that you look at around, um, you mentioned a a age as well, or gender, um, or, 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 or any other um, Factors that you feel are important that um, that that shape, you know, how how you do your work. Is is that something that you do do? Yeah. So we we use a CRM system which records quite a wide range of things. So on the monthly updates we give, we also feed in how many people have a, we put forward for the young persons fund. So facts up young people. Um, we're starting to flag up how many people we're putting forward for the parental support fund. Um, I do have splits on male, female starting businesses, male, females making inquiries. Um, so yeah, we, we do track that information and can give more detailed information if people are interested. Thank you. Any more questions? I'm not seeing any hands. So, oh, Luan, I've got you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, really good to see the case study shown Carly's experience. It's kind of brought it to life. Um, for me, I know it's early days, but is there a plan to follow people up like one, two years later to see if, um, if they've managed to stay in business? No formal plans for that. Um, survivability has always been one of those things that we've not had resource to look into. I mean, generally through the services that we provide, we help around a thousand people to start up in business each financial year. Um, we would love to be able to do the check-ins two years later, three years later to see how they've survived. Um, but, but it's been a resource element. So no formal plans to include that. But I would say from a from our perspective, the, the journey with people doesn't end with us once they do launch their business. We're there for the lifetime of their business um, and we very much open or operate an open door policy so they can come back with questions one year down the line, five years down the line, ten years down the line. Um, and we have advisors that would work with people at any level. So if they're into their next challenge where they've gone beyond a, you know, a one person business and maybe they want to take on a, a premises or a member of staff, we would support them with them. So we do want to be there for the journey of people's businesses, but tricky if they close down, if they don't tell us, we don't know. Thank you for that. I've, I've got a kind of follow up question to that. Um, obviously, people do come back um, because the nature of business a year down the line, you maybe want to think about a wee bit of expansion or actually taking on premises that you haven't originally done. As a ballpark, and, and I, I know you won't have the figures to hand, but as a ballpark, how many people come back um, once they've got themselves up and running to, to gain some additional help, advice, support from yourselves? Yeah, good question. Um, I don't have exact figures, but I probably do have some rough ones. So if you think about it, we get around 2,500 inquiries a year and around 1,800 of those are from people interested in starting up a business. So that probably means about 700 inquiries each year from existing businesses. Um, 
through. We have ERDF funding at the moment, so we do deliver some existing business support services. Um, they can be in a service with us for around 12 months. I think roughly off the top of my head, we have about 600 businesses going through those services. So we have good engagement with the existing businesses. I know that a lot of the reputation around Business Gateway and in general economic development support is focused on startup. We we do try and um, enforce the message that we're there through the life of people's businesses and for existing business support and expansion as well. Thank you very much. That was really helpful. Thank you. Any more questions? Lua, it, sorry, sorry, Lavina, have you yeah. got a question? I, I see you're lit up. Yes, yes, thank you. What I was wanting to ask was, the, these are um, not the big businesses. Um, I remember when I first joined the Prosperous, uh, Aber the, uh, Prosperous Aberdeen Economy gr uh, Group uh, that my first question was, where is the Chamber of Commerce and where is the Federation of Small Businesses? Now, just listening and thinking about what has just been said, I would say that the Federation of Small Businesses might be a good way as well to help these pe young people or whoever is starting up a new business to, to get more information, different information, you know, and not just the council. So I, I don't know um, if that's a helpful thing to put in or not. No, it is helpful and I'd agree. So we have good relationships with the Federation of Small Businesses. Um, you know, we will, what we do, because um, Business Gateway is funded by the city and shire councils, we can't be everything to um, everybody. So the FSB has some brilliant resources um, for very small businesses. Their membership fees are quite small. Um, so we, we do recommend people take advantage of the FSB membership um, and we, you know, we will regularly make referrals and you know go to the kind of online networking events that they do. In terms of the Chamber of Commerce, yeah, there's um, so our office is actually based just upstairs from them. So that's quite handy because I can go chat with their door um, and, you know, everybody in kind of the economic development space needs to operate the the no wrong door policy so if a business comes to any of us and it's maybe doesn't quite fit we need to be aware of who else is in that space and making sure that they're they're put to the right person kind of as quickly and as efficiently as possible good that sounds really good yeah i i yeah uh, it's not something that we talk much about in, in the community councils because um it's mostly people who are employed that, that are living in the various communities uh, and with a sprinkling of the enterprises going on. So, yes, that is something that, that I can bring back to the Civic Forum and the Community Council Forum and uh, just bring it up to the attention of people who is maybe thinking about things. Yeah, thank you very much. Councillor MacDonald. It was just to highlight that um, North wasn't doing so well in the graph, um, uh, and 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 just if if there were any reasons um, that you have for that. Yeah, so we we highlighted that um, I think in last month in our monthly report that we'd had no referrals for North. Um, in June we had one person come forward, so you know we we put in place that we need to get better connections there. Um, our community business advisor. Um, I believe has now found a location to be based in the north locality twice a month. Um, so hopefully that should then start to see improvements in the north. Um, but yeah, we're aware that that was zero for quite a long time. Thank you very much. If there's no further uh, questions, I'll, I'll take us to the next uh, case study for 10.3, reducing woeful fires uh, and ask Mr. Nelson if he'd like to introduce his report. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of the project manager, um, Group Commander Andrew Dick. Um, this is linked to LOIP stretch outcome 10, which is 25% fewer people receiving a first court conviction and 2% fewer people reconvicted within one year by 2026. Um, the project number is 10.6 and project name reducing woeful fires in Torrey and Ferry Hill, targeting engagement and early intervention through education. Um, what the group looked at was um, as a target area of Torrey and Ferry Hill um, as, a, as a pilot in an attempt to drive down the willful fire raising across the city by 10%. 
um, how we looked to do this through multi-agency um, work was early intervention and prevention um, through um, the schools projects, um, community engagement and education, especially during um, the COVID period where accessibility to face-to-face -to -face contact with um, the children and the education teams was extremely limited. Um, raising awareness and attempting to change behaviours, this has been looked at targeted messaging, communication through SFRS, um, national presentation, national projects, as well as, as local intervention within the schools. And um, lastly, strengthening um, targeted engagement linked to the grants. Um, this is a walks and talks um, education programme. Initially, our teams, multi-agency teams, which included the community rangers, um, countryside rangers, SFRS, Scottish Ambulance Service and Police Scotland, uh, joint engagement with the primary school children, primary six and seven, um, roughly 30, well, approximately 13 uh, primary schools were engaged with. Um, approximately 1,000 pupils um, received the talks um, at the school. Um, we couldn't always manage the full team engagement due to operational um, operational pressures, but the actual multi-agency team were um, extremely positive in their attempts to ensure that we presented the joint focus um, when we're speaking to the kids. And um, I, th I believe that that collaborative multi-agency approach is actually what gives the these Gramps Walks and Talks um, the, the impact that they do have. <clears throat> Looking at what we have achieved, 36% um, reduction in deliberate fires um, from our initial testing area of Torrey and Ferry Hill. Um, where deliberate fires were reduced from 57, which is the five-year average, due to 37. Um, this five-year average may be slightly higher than, um, than it actually is reasonable due to a very high spike in 2018, which was down to one individual. Um, we also have produced 49% reduction in secondary deliberate fires in Torrey and Ferry Hill, again reducing the five-year average from 54 to 28. Now, as I said, this is a partnership working with Scottish Ambulance Service and Police Scotland. Seven young offenders who were um, apprehended. Um, then, through an education program, which is known as Fire Setters Intervention, um, that re education scheme took place, and to date, none of these um, seven young offenders have re offended in this area. There's a, currently a video presentation, um, as well as the interaction with the leads within the schools. Now, the video presentation, while it has lasted, um, over 10 years and it still has its merits, um, it has become slightly dated. What has happened in the last 18 months is through collaborative working with um, Station Media House Unit, um, supported by Murray Dawson, um, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, supported by Area Commander Ewan, and we've managed to raise um, between two and two and a half thousand pounds to really re-energise this presentation, make it interactive, make it <clears throat> resilient for the next, I would say, 10 years, um, including such things as drone footage of the Gramps areas, um, faced uh, talking heads, interviews with members of Scottish Ambulance Service, Police Scotland um, and, um, and the countryside wardens to give that interactive feel. COVID, fingers crossed, is over, but the way this presentation and video interaction has been produced would allow it to be placed within schools and allow that education still to take place, even if we couldn't have that face-to-face -face engagement with the children. Um, a 72% reduction in refuse fires within Torrey and Ferry Hill um, linked to the last five years, which is an overall reduction of 31.5%. Um, the final presentation on video and interactive production that again has been led by the audiovisual uh, specialist within SHMU um, should be ready by the summer. It will be presented to um, all partners including the senior command team within Scottish Fire and Rescue and it may be available to our um, wider partner group to actually view this presentation on interactive production. And what we've learned, um, testing the changes one area has shown the impact that the, these education and intervention um, projects have. Um, while the citywide figure has increased slightly over the last year, um, it gives us confidence in the impact it's had in Torrey and Ferry Hill to 
continue with this um, area of production and education and to widen it out to the entire city. So the next steps, um, as I say, successful testing in Torrey and Ferry Hill. We'll now upscale this project citywide. Um, we are looking at targeting the Kingcorth area as there has been a slight increase in um, secondary fires and activity in the uh, Kingcorth area. I know the Priority Neighbourhood Partnership and Police Scotland and Scottish Fern Issue are working specifically in Kingcorth at this time, um, again, education as well as uh, intervention. Um, the positive I see is with the easing of COVID restrictions is that face-to-face -face engagement. Um, this year, <clears throat> as the restrictions did lift, um, there was 84 direct walks and talks and engagement sessions. Um, they have now all been completed and um, we're hoping to see that very strong engagement that took place in April and May have come to fruition, especially during these summer months when the schools are off. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if required. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Questions? Councillor Gray. Yeah, uh, th thanks very much for that inf for that information. Um, the uh, uh, the work that's involved um, has really made a, a big difference in it, and it's in it's been very intensive um, educational um, engagement with with the young people. Uh, and and um, I don't think you can underestimate uh, the benefits that that close working with schools and with the young people has made. And so for that reason, I just wondered if there was uh, if there was scope. Um, or if there's a need elsewhere, um, per perhaps Im immediately um, to expand this project elsewhere, is is there any um, is there any need um, in other parts of the city? The education aspect of it can be expanded. Um, the Gramps Walks and Talks does not just target Tory and Ferry Hill. That's been the target and focus for this and this pilot project. And we are already engaging with other areas, Northfield, Kincoth, et cetera, through the same project. Um, the multi-agency working and partnership working um, through Police Scotland, Scottish Ambulance Service um, and SFRS continues, for example, after the summer. No, this is not specifically a link to this project in relation to antisocial behaviour and the build up to um, the bonfire season, et cetera. And that well, the agency collaborative working does continue, and I feel that that will be an extension of this project um, moving forward. Yeah, good. Thank you. Lavina, do you want to come in with a question? No, I was just thinking good. It, it seems to be very good work that's been going on, uh, but I would suggest, it's just a comment from me, from my lifetime experience, that, that it should be spread to other parts of the the city perhaps as well, you know, where where there is uh, maybe some space where youngsters can congregate during the holidays and do damage. <laughs> Not necessarily it, fire raising damage. Uh, yeah, just in response to that, that the the, uh, the iHub, the community iHub <coughs> and the interactive work through our community engagement teams from all partners um, do periodically target um, areas that how would I say that spiked number of incidents or uh, events, um, such as um, the West Hills uh, shopping area, etc. That's been targeted um, through community. Very is possibly reactive, but then um, proactive events and planning takes place on the back of that. And um, there's been a very positive project linked to all Mac fire alarms being activated within Northfield, and Police Scotland, community wardens, and SFRS came together for a number of road shows um, within Northfield, within the um, Cornhill area, the high-rise uh, apartments, the high-rise buildings, just to again emphasise the emphasise to people who are possibly carrying out antisocial behaviour that we are in attendance and we are visible, but at the same time giving that reassurance to the residents of these areas um, that we we are there and we are looking at education and intervention and not just um, a reactive response. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that sounds very good. Yes, and and I commend all of all of that too. It, it's just that maybe with a little bit more financing that you could do a little bit more. It, that on the background, I think I'm hearing that you could do just a little bit more with a little bit more 
and uh, either staff or money or, or well, it's, should I call it combined as resources? Yes, yes. But thank you for the information. It's very useful. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Any further questions? OK, thank you very much, Mr Nelson. If I take us to the 12.6, the increasing distribution of Naxalone, uh, Mr Rayner, please. Good afternoon. Um, I can't take much credit for all the hard work that other people have done to progress this project. In particular, Fiona Lindsay and Lucy Simpson and Alison Swanson have uh, done a tremendous amount of work pulling all this together. Just to set the context, naloxone is a medication that reverses, temporarily reverses opioid overdose, so heroin, methadone, morphine, etc. And it's free and available to families and friends and people at risk of overdose. Um, we might think that that's typically a drug user, but increasingly people are being supported at home on all sorts of pain reducing medication. So it applies to uh, more and more of the population in, in a sense. So kits are available from uh, community pharmacy, drug and alcohol services, and there are online uh, ways of distributing the, the kits out to, to people who want them uh, to have them present in their uh, homes or first aid kits, etc. Drug deaths in Scotland have uh, rightly been described as a public health emergency and Aberdeen City Council should be commended for uh, taking the, the initiative in response to that public health emergency and deciding to become a corporate distributor of naloxone. And what that means is that there are now policies and procedures within Aberdeen City Council to train staff um, to be able to distribute naloxone out to families and friends of people at need, in need. Um, so specifically uh, housing staff, criminal justice social work staff, uh, and um, a number of other sort of sectors within the, the council are, are currently undertaking training. And the progress has also included uh, creating in-house resources and in-house in training uh, capacity. So really what happens is the Aberdeen City Council now becomes a, a frontline distributor of, of naloxone and has its own policies, procedures and, and training resources to support that. One of the key challenges we still have is that although we've trained a number of staff, um, over 100 uh, ACC staff uh, trained, there is still a challenge of, of increasing the number of kits getting out into the community. Um, and Police Scotland and Scottish Fire and Rescue also aware that they're undertaking sort of workforce level developments to uh, be distributors or uh, to have naloxone available for their staff in, in emergency situations. Um, so what that really means is that we now have uh, three significant public sector organisations leading uh, the role of ensuring that naloxone is available where, when and where it's needed in, in the community. So really the, the, the main ask today is that really keen to hear from other organisations, particularly those with engagement with large swathes of the, the population, uh, to also sign up and uh, be distributors of, of naloxone to the very vulnerable people who uh, continue to die in our city from uh, opioid overdose. And happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I was just question. going to add a little bit of context around about, um, and I guess just illustrate the the, the value, I guess, in, in terms of the this particular project and how we can all kind of contribute to it. I mean, certainly in my own organisation, um, we had a, I think it was a three month pilot or um, where we had three divisions in Police Scotland of the, the 13 North East Vision wasn't one of those, but in that time, all operational officers were trained and, and um, had the carriage of naloxone in that time. And there were 70 distributions, so I would suggest a number of lives saved in that time. Um, so the Chief Constable made a commitment um, following that and following kind of review and um, reflection of that particular pilot that um, 
as an organisation corporately, we will train all operational officers. So what that means in, in terms of, I guess, figures for, for the North East and, and for Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire and Murray is that we'll have circa 700 police officers trained in the carriage and, and use of naloxone by September this year. So the commitment organisationally is that all operational officers will have will, will complete that training by October and for, for ourselves that should be September. So I totally recognise it's coming at the kind of tail end of, of this kind of um, project charter. However, I think um, as Simon has kind of outlined, I think um, every little that we can do will, will contribute to the, the, the public well crisis that, that we're facing in terms of drug-related death. So just by way of context, thank you, Chair. No, thank, thank you for that. I would, I would echo that because I'm sure very often it's going to be the blue light services that are the front line uh, really when these situations arise um, and you can't overestimate that. And I guess just that the other aspect we're working through, obviously working closely with NHS, but um, with, with Scottish Ambulance Service as well, just recognising that actually that initial distribution is one thing, but that the life-saving kind of treatment that might be required thereafter needs to follow very quickly. Um, so there's kind of um, MOUs and whatnot being kind of worked through through our organisation. But again, and I know we've kind of had a brief discussion there, but it'd be worth kind of having that kind of connection and link up around about the, the work that we're doing locally. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see the name on the screen. I can. And, and then I think. Luan, do you want to come in first and then? Yeah, um, great. Thank you. Really good to see the commitment from ACC and the police and fire and rescue. Um, I suppose just being in community planning um, today and thinking about looking a bit wider than services um, and I'm wondering if there's been work done to engage um, groups like taxi drivers, street vendors and, and groups like that that may come in, into contact with vulnerable people and also thinking about our universities and colleges um, and their engagement with porters, catering staff, all the different groups that, that are kind of invisible support networks in our city that we could maybe um, tap into um, to get help with this, because, you know, as we've already heard, you know, this is this is quite a quite a crisis and, and even one death is one too many because because they are preventable and we know the impact that that leaves on families and communities. So I just wondered if there's been wider work done um, with the universities and with these different groups that are out with services. Thank you. Yeah, do you want so, to come back on that, Mr. Reina? Yes, of course. Um, so we've got a, a rolling campaign uh, the, now that ACC has sort of signed up and, and sort of uh, created a pathway uh, for other organisations that we want to encourage those other organisations now to to sign up and, and we can train their staff, help them develop the policies and procedures. As part of the rolling campaign, we have uh, some scheduled radio adverts for North, North Sound uh, adverts that are going to be in, included in buses, um, some discussion around taxis. We've had uh, communication from uh, welfare officers in Aberdeen University uh, who, who patrol the grounds uh, around the, the, the campuses to uh, encourage them. So the, there's lots of things in the pipeline. I guess what we're really looking for are sort of big organisations with uh, sort of big footfall of, of vulnerable people coming in daily um, to sign up and and uh, you know really get the the distribution going. Um, there's obviously still an element of stigma uh, and uncertainty uh, for people being uh, involved in the lock zone and, and sort of an anxiety for some uh, sectors. But I think that the work that Aberdeen City Council has done and particularly you know the the opportunity for distribution through. Uh, waste services staff or libraries etc really uh, is encouraging and I would just finally make a distinction between we're, we're not necessarily I mean it's good that people will be able to administer naloxone in an emergency but really what we're needing to do is get uh, naloxone out to family members and friends uh, to, to so that the, the, the it's about the distribution of naloxone to the most vulnerable um, that we want to to try and uh, prioritise, um, as well as uh, equipping sort of first on the scene uh, responders to to actually have 
naloxone available in an emergency situation. But really what we need to do is, is get it out into the community uh, on a routine basis. Thank you for that. I've got Chair and then Phil, please. Thank you, Chair. Just, just to give an overview of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Services plan for um, implementing Loxone. So um, on Monday, a mandatory training slash awareness package um, was issued out so that every member of staff can, can access that. Um, the, the future planning is to have Loxone on every frontline appliance. Um, and ask for volunteers to be trained in its use. Um, the, there won't be a like an emergency response to utilise that. It would be just literally if we came across uh, anybody who required it and providing with somebody trained to administer it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Phil, do you want to come in? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, uh, I think we should be very clear in commending the work that uh, Mr. Renner has actually introduced to us this afternoon, ensuring there's an effective system to make available naloxone and ensuring that people feel comfortable and confident to use it in what will be traumatic circumstances for someone who finds uh, a drug user in a near death situation is, is to be commended. I think I would though want to just gently remind members of the uh, of the group that this is one point in time in the overall arc of work that we need to be considering in preventing drug deaths. So there are areas of work which we need to carry forward to ensure that people are not actually drug using or are less likely to be in a situation where drug use can lead to uh, significant overdose at risk and causing risk of death. And similarly, for any individual who has um, any individual who has uh, overdosed and when naloxone is used, there is a requirement to ensure that we are effectively following that individual up and then putting in place the help and support needed so that they don't simply return to uh, uh, drug use behaviours which might put them at subsequent risk. So I, I would encourage people to, to look not just at naloxone but to look at the precursors to using naloxone and what happens subsequently as part of an overall programme of work in the round. And I know that Mr. Rayner and the ADP and its partners are actually looking at that very actively. Thank you very much for that. I'm seeing quite a few nodding heads in agreement, so mm -hmm. I think we're all pretty much on the same page on this one. Um, does anybody else wish to come back in? Not see. Lavina, are you wanting to come in? Yeah, I was just going to ask: is is this somehow put to the universities as well? I can think of students who are, you know, maybe very stressed with their studies and things like that, turning to something that they shouldn't be. And is there some way that that um, things can be done within the universities to catch them at an early stage and, and, and not have any deaths or even a continued drug use and things like that. Or are they just relying on going to the local chemist or their friends are, or I don't know. I, I think we've got a reply for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I can only speak for the University of Aberdeen, but but we have an extensive student welfare service that operates on the campus and also at the Hillhead Student Village. Um, we provide an awful lot of drug support and drugs counselling for students. Um, and while we've been in this meeting, I've actually just forwarded the very helpful one page summary to my colleague that leads on that and I've, and I've asked him to get in touch with you. Oh, very good. Very good. Thank you for that. Yes, that's reassuring because I'm just thinking that Aberdeen University used to have about 2,000 students and I don't know what it is now, 12,000, 20,000. And there must be some of them falling by the wayside, either into drink or drugs or something to relieve, relieve the stresses of getting through their exams and whatever, whatever. So, yes, it's nice to know that this is going to be looked at continued 
and looked at in the other other places as well, like the college and like the um, Robert Gordon's. Yes. So that's nice to know. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Professor Edwards. I think that shows how voluble the board is that we can take in different groups. Um, I've got uh, Duncan Coburn. Thank you. Just from the perspective of Robert Gordon University, I can just uh, reiterate what Pete said in terms of our own um, student life services and the fact that we have dedicated members of staff uh, based within each of our, our main halls of residence uh, precisely to look at these issues as well as community co cohesion and uh, likewise I've forwarded um, this information to the, the head of that team. Thank you very much indeed for that. And I've got Councillor MacDonald. Thanks very much, Chair. And as somebody who did go through the training, I um, wholeheartedly um, support um, the, the um, um, increased distribution of, of naloxone that's, that's here in front of us. But I did want to just perhaps understand a little better um, um, because I don't personally have um, uh, naloxone um, that, that I have um, to give out, but I, I do understand better how it is administered. And, and I think during the training, um, what I tended to pick up was that it, it, it could really be more at home and it tends to be quite well established um, a drug user. So quite often it's people who are older and it, and it might just be worth understanding that from uh, Mr. Rayner a, a little bit better about about you know the, the population that that of, of that 56 in 2020 who um, did um, who died as a, as a result of, of, of uh, drugs and how many of that was related to um, the um, um, methadone or, or heroin or the, or the things that naloxone could help with um, and 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 really the context um, because it isn't something that I've heard of much around um, the city centre for example and it was just to to understand a little better um, where the, the the people who have um, had naloxone administered to them and have survived um, just to just to get that kind of grouping um because I, I, my worry i guess is that we um we we, we tend to maybe think that it is a, a, a lifestyle choice young people thing but my my understanding is it's it's a much more deep rooted problem that that we're tackling here mr reynard do you want to come back on that sure um so the majority of deaths in, in aberdeen are opioid based so uh heroin or or diverted other opioid substances the the other substance that uh often used in combination are benzodiazepines um now naloxone works with opioid overdoses but i guess the the key point of discussion when we're encouraging and uh trying to to get naloxone distributed is that the, the key message is always to call an ambulance and to be able to undertake sort of basic first aid if, if required. So really, I mean, although naloxone in itself might not prevent all overdoses of all substances, it is a point of discussion and a, point, a, a, a way of promoting uh, a, a, a good response to an emergency situation. Because of the illicit nature of substances, people can be a bit reluctant to phone 999 for an ambulance because they think the police might become involved. So I think the, the message that we're getting from Kate and Police Scotland is that there is a, a bit of a change in, in perspective or communication. There's an opportunity there to, to try and encourage people to recognise that first and foremost, the police are there to save lives and help people. Um, and, and that that's the priority in, in all our work in terms of public safety. In terms of, of where people are dying or overdosing, uh, the vast majority of, of overdoses we see are in the city centre um, and there is a, a sort of distribution within some of the more deprived communities. So whilst um, Councillor MacDonald is, is correct that there are sort of some people who have used substances for a long, long time, have quite chronic uh, other health and social issues um, and the, these are the people who, uh, by and large, are, are the majority of people who are dying. Um, that's not to say that it's only uh, within those areas that what we do see and recently reviewed uh, deaths of four young 
people, four young men, uh, all under the age of 24, uh, who sadly passed away, and aware of a, a, a 23-year-old who has recently passed away. Um, and yes, the majority of them had traumatic childhoods, uh, very complex upbringings, uh, but also within that there were uh, young people who just experimented and tried with subs uh, you know, tried substances or almost on a recreational basis. So uh, we we can be quite tactical of where we want to distribute naloxone, um, and it's about making every opportunity count. And we do know that the the precursors to overdose are you know declining mental well-being, uh, other stressors in life, using lots of other substances, etc. Um, but that's not to say that it won't impact across the the, the population. Um, so it really is about getting a consistent message out that, that using substances is highly dangerous, um, that naloxone uh, and the promotion of uh, basic life support is is paramount, and uh, that by reducing the fatal overdoses, we can then increase our activity to support people with non-fatal overdoses and support them with treatment, uh, etc. Uh, as Phil mentioned, we've got a wider strategy, which is about uh, trying to reduce uh, not just drug deaths, but drug use in, in general uh, in our population. Thank you very much for that. I've got Councillor Radley and then Lavina. Thanks. Thank you. Um, it was around, um, well, it, it's very welcome that Aberdeen City Council has become a corporate distributor of naloxone and other sort of blue light organisations have become um, distributors as well. Um, where I sort of, I, I listened to your response earlier about sort of getting out into communities and sort of dispelling the myths around carrying and using naloxone where someone maybe has a concern about a family member or friend or it, are there opportunities for sort of private individuals to get the naloxone training if they have concerns about their specific um, family member, friend, etc. Um, and, you know, is, is this something that you're hoping to expand, you know, the training to private businesses? Um, you know, we've got large oil and gas companies, etc. Um, in, in Aberdeen who you know, if if training was available to them, it might help to widen the widen the net of naloxone carriers and people who are able to use it if needed. Yep. Can I? Will I come back on that, Councillor Nicholl? Yep. So uh, absolutely, any anybody can have uh, a naloxone kit as a, a private individual. Um, you don't have to be using substances yourself. It could be somebody in your family that you're concerned about. You can go into a community pharmacy, uh, most community pharmacies in Aberdeen, and they will, you know, talk you through how to use it, and you can go away with a the kit there and then. There's also an organisation. I'll put the the details in the chat. Um, where you can do uh, a, an online click and deliver, so they'll post a kit out to you. So there's even more discretion in that if you don't want to speak to a local pharmacist. Um, so it's available that way. I would love that if we had uh, businesses and, and organisations in Aberdeen who are interested in doing this. Um, again, going back to Aberdeen City Council breaking the mould, and that if Aberdeen City Council can put this at pace in place, um, then other organisations can, and there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be uh, included in, in first aid kits in any organisation. I do know that you know there are certain uh, sectors where there is maybe a higher prevalence of of uh, substance harm in, in some uh, respects. So you know we'd be happy for any links or uh, opportunity to speak to to companies in re regards to that. Thank you very much for that. Lavina? No, sorry, I had not taken my hand down from the last time. Apologies. No problem. I'm not seeing any more hands. So with that, um, we have the recommendations on page 192, 193. There are six. Can we agree the recommendations? Thank you. 
Um, that takes us to 3.2, which is the project end 1.1, increasing the number of people using community pantries by 20% by 2023. Uh, Mr McGowan, do you want to introduce the report? Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, real privilege to be here to talk to this uh, and the following report, um, project end report rather. Um, the purpose of this report is around uh, demonstrating the 20% increase in use of community pantries has been achieved. Um, and uh, the report you have in front of you details um, how that's been managed. Um, you'll see there is a graph in there at 4.1 that demonstrates that's gone from 487 to 754 members. So excellent work, um, an area that's of real importance to us and we probably touched on earlier on today. So um, the background is there. Obviously, the the new um, group was identified, anti-poverty group through the um, community plan in Aberdeen. Um, figures there say about 21.5% of children in Aberdeen City are living in poverty. We know that's the last reliable data set um, that we have. Um, and so that the project you have, uh, the report you have rather, sets out the aims, the changes that were tested out and how successful they were. Um, you'll see from the, the graph itself, I mentioned that overall it's gone up significantly. Um, the main increases there around C fine and the number of members they have, um, but some some progress in the mobile pantry as well, which is something we've been keen um, citywide to, to gather some interest in. Um, and uh, yeah, positive um, increases in volunteering as well. Um, some user testimony there around um, why people enjoy the pantry, um, the, the lack of stigma there, less worry, less stress, um, and a, a massive increase from a uh, almost no uh, mobile pantry when it first started to um, well, just over a year's time, best part of 100 people in there. So really positive. Um, I won't talk too long about it. Um, I hopefully everyone's read the report and, and recognises the benefit there, but I'm happy to answer any questions or to try and answer any questions if um, you have any. And one thing to note would be that, of course, while this is a project end report, um, that's simply the end of this part of the project. The work will continue and we'll still be working to, to increase those members. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mr McGowan. I think that sort of takes us back to where we were earlier, because I think this is one of the areas that we would maybe want to look back at. Uh, questions for Mr McGowan, please. Yep. OK, um, doesn't appear to be any questions. Everybody's obviously enjoyed your report. Uh, in that case, um, can we agree the recommendation at page 226? Agreed, thank you. Um, that takes us to 3.3, .3, the project end for 10.1. Um, I have Mr McGowan again. Thank you. Um, I should have uh, mentioned, I can't take the credit, it was Sam Lays and C Fine who's created that report. I'm merely representing her today. Um, like I am representing uh, Mike Hebden from the prison for uh, 3.3 um, uh, and Daly Smith. So yes, again, excellent work here um, around accessing support services through HMP Grampian. Um, really important element of um, liberation from prison is support in the community, making sure people have that set up before they leave and then that, that is maintained in the community. Um, again, the details of what we were trying to achieve there um, and the test, uh, the change ideas that were tested are identified. Um, and I'm just scrolling down here because uh, there is a graph there. Yeah, so you'll see at 4.1 uh, the increase um, in individuals engaging with support services on release, um, really important. Um, change it obviously that goes from 2019 to 2021 so across the COVID period as well so it shows the power of work that's been done um, at the prison to make sure people are ready for liberation and getting that level of support um, and that, that support has been sustained largely 100% um, of individuals for example at 4.3 registered with a GP um, upon release uh, compared with an average of 66%, huge increase there and really important one for, for community health. Um, and yeah, 100% uh, of individuals accessing suitable accommodation upon release. 
um, which again is an increase, um, and this is a this is really important in terms of the city council's housing team, but also partners that we work with around uh, the provision of food parcels, medication, um, PPE. You'll see are listed in there as well. So a really excellent partnership approach to to supporting people who are being liberated. Um, again, the stats are there. The graphs are really a uh, really good in illustrating where the uh, improvements have been made. The commitment there is to sustain is to sustain those. Um, improvements obviously um, and at section five there you'll see ideas that we have around how the approach that we've taken to, could be expanded into other areas for example at uh, the young offenders institute and looking at remands and how that type of approach might help um, in the the criminal justice system and in the prison system overall so um yeah i'll stop there but um again really excellent work and um happy to be here to talk to it thanks Thank you very much. I, I, I can but echo your, your comments um, to colleagues. It, it really is an excellent report and it's an excellent piece of work that's been ongoing. Um, and, and I'm sure it actually does help break some of the cycles that we are very keen to break. Any questions for Mr McGowan? I'm not seeing any hands. In that case, can we agree the six recommendations between pages 234 and 235? Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. And that takes us to project end for 15.1 with green spaces. And we've got Mr Shaw with us. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, everyone. I'm here to speak about my end report for um, increasing the number of community run green spaces. Um, we've been running this charter now since early part of 2021. And it's just been fantastic, to be honest. We've had so many um, in engaging new groups work with us in the city. Um, some at very different levels now, in different stages in terms of, of our, their community green spaces, but we've just seen an incredible uptake in um, different groups across the city wanting to be involved in their local green spaces. You'll all have read my report uh, and, and the various bits and pieces and the data. You, you'll have seen we're at 36 groups come the, the June this year, which is an amazing achievement in terms of, of new spaces. But I think it would have helped, it will help to tell you a story about one of our groups in terms of the difference that has made to our, um, to their local space and the community um, in that area. So within my report, I've got a quote from Sam, who, who's um, part of the Fresh Community Wellness Group down in Seaton. Now, I'm sure some of you will know about Sam and, and Fresh. They're, they're a lovely group who, um, I first met a couple of years back, met Sam to do some letter picking um, down in, in Seaton. And he had an ambition to do um, some great things for the local area, to involve local people. And, and it was all about mental health and about social inclusion and to bring people together um, with one goal to improve the area. And that started with letter picking, which was great, but it's now developed into so much more. And, and it's a, a really good example of, of what if you give good people that bit of support and encouragement, what good people can achieve. And, and I've been amazed with what Sam and the group um, have achieved. If you get a chance, go and have a wander down to North Sea Court. Um, it's an incredible space. It's not everyone's cup of tea because it is a wee bit big borrow steel to get all things working, but it's fine. He's got all the appropriate permissions in place. Um, but it's the, the connection he's made with local people and other groups that is such an inspiration. Sam is, is now working closely with um, the local school. Um, Sport Aberdeen are a group that, that Sam's recently connected with. He, the Sikh Temple he's connected with, the Friends of Seaton Park he's connected with. And he's doing this just by knocking on doors and asking how he can help. And then consequently that help is shared. So it's, it, it's become almost our new template for what a community can do if you just give them a wee bit of, bit of freedom and a bit of encouragement to do it. Sam um, has, has just this last 12 months been applying for funding and he's he, he's got a knack. He's, he just keeps sending me checks because the, their group doesn't currently have a bank account so that the city council are looking after their funds for them to ensure that they, that money is spent. Yep. But that's all now been sorted. They're now constituted and formalised and that bank account is now ready to go. Yep. So we'll be transferring the money back. But he, tens of thousands of pounds Sam has now raised for that local community um, and he's got great ideas, great ambition to do more and more for, for the area. I keep reining him back because he, he's trying to do too much in one go, um, but he's very much now learned that he can't do it himself 
uh, and, and that he's speaking to other people in the local area to help him with that. So Sam is a really good story, but even Sam, it's a very early early stage of his group, and they've got so much more they will achieve if they just get that that support and, and buy in from other council services and other organisations. So I just wanted to share that with you because that's um, it, it tells a story. Um, far better than the data does. Although the data looks very promising and stats are great, it's the real life stuff that you want to know about and, and what difference that is making. Um, all these groups, this is our my um, project end report, but these groups don't get to escape. They're now part of our, our family, whether they like it or not. And we will now continue to work alongside them and, and be part of, of what of that partnership working uh, and just celebrate with them whenever they do something good. So um, happy to take questions. Um, but please, if you get a chance, go for a wander down and say hello because they're, they're, they're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Shaw. Um, and, and it's a really excellent report. I have to agree with you. And, and the sheer numbers of people you've managed to draw in uh, is absolutely fantastic. Uh, questions for Mr Shaw? Um, I've got Luan online. Thanks. Thank you. More a comment on, on the three reports, really. Um, it's good to see that they're being embedded and carried forward. That would have been my main concern, um, uh, uh, you know, from closing them here. Um, but I, w I just think that in other areas, people struggle to understand what community planning is there to do. And I think these examples in Aberdeen really show in real situations the power of different organisations coming together, working with communities. And I just wonder if there are any plans to make some small videos that, that show the stories and um, just 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 as we've heard this afternoon, because I think um, the more we can spread the word about how community planning can actually work, the more likelihood we are of getting more volunteers and more buy in from lots of parts of our community. So it was just a thought whether there are plans to um, showcase these um, in videos. Or, or other formats. Thank you. Mr Shaw, do you want to come back on that? Y yeah, thank you. Just to say, um, last year um, during COVID and, and lockdowns and things, we did a lot of, we kept in touch with a lot of our groups through um, digital means uh, and, and we ran our, our um, Beautiful Scotland campaign as normal, but without anybody being there. So what we did was we asked our groups to do little films but I, I made the schoolboy error of forgetting to ask their permission to use the films. So we weren't able to, to use it as wide. But what we've done this year is done the same again. So I'm currently getting sent films from all over the city, from com community groups, just telling a very short and brief story about what they've achieved and, and how proud they are of their space. And I plan to put all that in a wee package together. Um, and I'm sure if we had somebody introducing it and somebody it would make a lovely film. So we're certainly doing that in environmental services. And I'm this time I have made sure I've got the appropriate permissions to share it. Um, so this time round, it'll be spread as far and wide as I can, I, I can manage. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I have to agree. I've actually been to quite a, a few, uh, not all by any means, because they seem to be growing uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, but I have been to quite a, f a number of them and uh, they are actually quite outstanding in some of the work and some of the diversity of the work that is being done in different areas. So uh, I think there really is a, a good news story in here. Um, any further questions for Mr Shaw? It's not really a question. It's just uh, it's the second time I've heard this story about Stan, and uh, I'm even more inspired the second time. I've got to say, um, also in relation to video or film footage, you know that the Shmoo do have a um, community television team, and it may well be beneficial. The maybe you could encompass a number of the projects. Uh, maybe worth we'll get in touch with Murray Dawson or Ross Bull at Shmoo, and they may be able to assist. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and another example of the board actually interacting and cross working together. Absolutely great. Uh, Lavina, I think I've got you lit up for a question. Thanks. Yes, it, it wasn't. It wasn't a well. It wasn't a question. It was a bit of encouragement. It was to say more power to their elbows, <laughs> uh, because I, it's it's a wonderful thing. We've got um, a, what we call the Kuta volunteers, and they do several things like one. Of, one of them is they've re, re um, constructed and improved the walking path along the River D in Cooter. Uh, they they ha and we have another group that do uh, does the Christmas lights, 
we've got a um, Cooter and Bloom, and they all started. What clicked it in my brain was the fact that you were saying that that you were handling the money to start with with the Seaton Group, and that's what we did with the Cooter and Bloom Group. They, once they they're now all reconstitu reconstituted in themselves and themselves and handling their own money and things like that, but. But uh, no, I think it's wonderful. And the more of this that can be done, because sometimes doing something really pleasurable and helping your mind, your, your mental health sort of thing, is something that you can then ask people, well, would you like to help us or get a friend to help us with some other project that comes under the, the LOIP, you know? So, so yes, I, I think it's a wonderful project that's got started there in Seton and more power to their elbow. Councillor Macdonald. Just one quick question. Um, I guess these are over and above the things like Friends of that we have already, um, Mr Shaw. Yeah, so we, we currently work with around about 150 different groups. These are new groups for this last um, year and a half or so. Um, the, the Friends groups they, they fled the nest now. They don't need our help anymore. They're very much just doing their own thing. So, um, yes, these, these are additional. Thank you. If I could just say, I think you're being very modest, Mr Shaw, because we certainly have interaction with lots of the friends groups and they do sing your praises greatly. And I think it is actually well deserved. So, um, you know, I, I think you're, you're hiding under uh, a, a bushel there, if I can use that uh, pun to some extent. Um, the, any more questions for Mr Shaw? Lavina, you want to come back in? No, no, no. Yeah. I, 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 I'm feeling very cheered up. So listening to the Tory fires and then the need for Naxalone or whatever it's called, I was getting a bit depressed, but this has made me feel very much more cheerful. And it's a, a really good, possibly near the end of the meeting, it's cheering everybody else up as well. So yes, that's why I was saying more power to their elbow. So no, no questions. My, I suppose the question would be is how can we encourage other communities to look and see how they can help with the projects that are going on in their communities as well under the various um, projects that are going on under the LOIP, yes. And that's a long and difficult question, I'm sorry. I don't know if I can speak for the whole lot, but certainly for in terms of community green spaces and, and volunteering, um, food growing, biodiversity, it's, it's word of mouth, you know, that, that again, yeah. using Fresh and Seton as an example, they've now connected up with, 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 with people I've introduced them to. And from there, they've come back saying, well, how do we now do what Sam's doing? Um, you know, and, and that, and, and just let people get on with it. I don't yeah. have the resource or the time to do it for them. But you don't need to. If you just encourage them and, and just support them, just to get, take those first few steps, because many of them still think if they were to stick a spade in the ground that the council would find them. Uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed at some of the stories I hear. Um, but it's just ensuring that, the, that they've got that, that bit of support and that permission to, to do what's... And it's very simple things to do. And they're not looking to, to change the world, so to speak. But these little connections that they're making in these areas are making such a difference to a local community. So it's just people speaking. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if we have no further questions, there are three recommendations on page 224. Two, four. Can we agree the recommendations? Agreed. Thank you very much. And that takes us to the last item on the agenda, which I personally read with great interest, and I will be very interested to see where this goes over the next few weeks. Um, if it's the Health Determinants Research Collaborative, quite a big meaty title. Uh, over to you, uh, Mrs Scott. Uh, thank you, Councillor Nicol. Um, as the partnership know, we've been trying to progress a research forum for ourselves, um, independently of this opportunity to submit a funding application to NIHR. And we've been making some progress with that and we've been making some progress with our multi-agency approach to, to data. But it's probably fair to say both of those issues are hugely challenging and on top of all that, that we're we're already doing. But but 
we've been making good strides in, in that. NIHR is the National Institute of Health Research, which is focused on the whole of the UK. And the um, I think it's the Chief Medical Officer, Chris Whitty, has a passion uh, to build the capability of public health within local government. And that's quite a deliberate agenda on his part, I think, in recognising that the um, determinants of population health largely sit within the function of local government and its, and its partners. Um, so a very deliberate move on the part of the, the CMO to build the capability. So as a consequence of that direction that, that he gave to the NIHR, um, they elected to uh, kick off a funding round uh, to receive applications from local government across the whole of United Kingdom. I should have said that NIHR has that portfolio. The Scottish Government are involved, the Welsh and the Northern Ireland. So, so it's not a, a, an English based, it's for the whole of, of United Kingdom. Uh, so we were uh, we took the opportunity as a partnership to put in our bid and uh, we were delighted to then be uh, shortlisted, the only Scottish local authority to be shortlisted, which is which is fantastic. So um, we've been hugely supported. Our bid went in under, I think it's 22 co-applicants, which is a kind of real testament to this partnership, as you've been saying uh, throughout the meeting today, that we've had a huge amount of support from, from colleagues, including, I have to say, being grilled for a mock interview uh, by some members who are here today uh, for, for our rehearsal for our formal submission. Uh, so we, a number of us presented our bid to the second round last week, uh, ably supported by colleagues who had prepped us. And, and if I say so ourselves, I think Team Aberdeen did brilliantly last week in the in the bid. Uh, but in true fashion, we don't get any feedback immediately. We have to wait until the end of July before the determination on whether we are we're successful. Um, as we presented our bid, we were really clear about the um, how the HDRC, and you're right, it's a mouthful, uh, we were really clear about the HDRC would be embedded in the community planning. So although the CMO is absolutely focused on building the capability in local government, we're clear that, that our work around public health is in completely done in partnership through the community plan and partnership. Um, now, clearly, that the, there's definitely something for the council to, to gain as a result if we are successful, but we also think there's there's equal benefit for the partnership as, as well. So in response to some of the questions in the session, we were clear that the sustainability, so uh, we will get an injection of cash, which will be very welcome, Levina. Uh, so it'd be nice to get an injection of cash for a for a change. Uh, we'll spend that wisely if we are successful, um, but we're clear that the sustainability of our approach to an HDRC will come through uh, will come as a result of embedding it in our community plan and partnership. In working with Scottish government colleagues, so it's really welcome David's with us today, because um, again I think we've had a letter of support from Scottish Government in our applications. So again, sustainability will come from working with and influencing Scottish Government and its and a number of its national agencies, including Public Health Scotland, to take the learning from what Aberdeen and Aberdeen Community Planning Partnership gains from if we're successful on an, HDR, uh, on an HDRC and how that then can be scaled up across the whole of Scotland. And clearly, um, I'll have a responsibility for, for sharing the learning across local government. And I'll do that in partnership with COSLA and, and colleagues in the Improvement Service. But we'd certainly be looking to share this through the National Community Planning uh, Improvement Board, which all partners nationally are a member of as, as well. So we, ho we hope that we gave... Um, it, uh, NIHR confidence that this wouldn't just be a pot of money that wouldn't have any legacy to, to it. And we were really clear, and, and I guess it does pick up on the conversation today, we were clear about the real um, set of circumstances facing Aberdeen at this point in time, um, post-pandemic, in the midst of a cost of living and an energy sector that's transitioning and what that's doing for our economy is as well. So we were well supported by Phil Mackey, who was part of that pitch team. And we again, we were describing the uniqueness of this and therefore the absolute need for the best brains 
to be supporting us in all of our work so that we can make sure that all those vulnerable families in the city are supported the best in the best way that we can as a as a partnership. So huge team Aberdeen effort to get to, to this point. Many colleagues involved, far too many to name, but I would want to single out Martin Murchie in particular, um, who I think has done a fantastic job in corralling what's been huge complexity, huge cultural differences have re revealed themselves across just because it's a completely different world for us as council to be involved in the in the research community. But but we've we've enjoyed every moment and we're really grateful to all colleagues for the support they've given us to, to get to this application. And I would just ask the partnership to keep their fingers and toes and thumbs all crossed that we are uh, we are successful. However, in the event that we're not, uh, we will continue to kind of reflect on it and then just keep working on the approach that we were doing. But obviously, every bit of cash does help to accelerate some some things. So keep your fingers and toes crossed, and we will um, report back on the outcome. We should hear by the end of end of July, uh, and happy to feedback obviously on the results of that. If we're successful, there'll be a plan of attack because we need to move quickly. And again, the panel were holding us to account for our ability to move quickly. Uh, so if we are successful, happy to come back to, to this board with how we'll move forward. And if we're not successful, keep our fingers crossed we are, but if we're not, again, happy to come back to report how we would just build on that experience and how we would, we would take it forward. But I think already what we have gained is is our understanding of research bids, the capability that sits in, in both of our universities locally. And on the back of this, we've already put in two other bids for other pots of, of money. So I think this will become yeah. the nature of our partnership council, Nickel, going forward, that we will really continually uh, do all this. And I think all of our community planning partners will benefit from the research questions that we will be able to, to pose. I'd include police and fire colleagues in, in that as much as the much as the local authority. So positive, hopefully, way to, to end and um, our, just a rally call to support Team Aberdeen and hopefully we get a good a good uh, result with some extra cash. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Nicole. Thank you very much, Mrs. Scott. And uh, it certainly gets my vote. Uh, and, and I've got every confidence, see, especially seeing the, the people who have put themselves forward to be involved in the project. It really is an impressive uh, list. Uh, and I, I do think that it's a very, very strong bid. And it does rather take us back to what we were speaking about at the beginning of our meeting when we were actually emphasising the importance of data and evidence in some of the work that the, the board actually do. Um, and that really is reflected in pieces of work like this, which will be a huge piece of work. Uh, and uh, I must admit, Mr. Murchie did give me an update on it, and I was wholly impressed. But enough of me. Lavina, I have a, a, yourself for a comment or a question, please. No, no, I'm just absolutely delighted that this is going to happen. Uh, the... Uh, Health, health side of things is very important to people to keep them um, in, in balance, you know, if, if they have good mental health, they, that helps them to keep good physical health. And they're then willing to um, volunteer and do things for their community as well. It's a very big positive that. And I, I have been... Um, getting good good uh, results from from um, what went on and big research that was done in the eye clinic quite a number of years ago where they now have uh, uh, were, were, the, were the leaders for the UK from their research in in the treatment of macular degeneration which is where the retina at near the air nerve at the back of the eye is beginning to break up and you don't see so well and you, you, they, they, they now have this um, treatment which they get you into and you, you uh, just feel absolutely wonderful. My father had this condition, it must be genetic, so, so that now that I have it, I'm getting treatment. He never did. Uh, and and uh, I am absolutely, if I could put two hands up for two votes, I would do it for this programme. I think it's again our universities are showing great initiative and, and, and the, the health service 
that they are supporting uh, is is wonderful. Uh, all as and as I said to the last program, all power to your elbow, and I hope they're successful in the other bids they're going after. At the last meeting, I also got and 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 would like to thank the the research money that's now made made available or made known to communities, and that is through the tracker fund, a fund tracker, I should say, that now is now coming out to the community councils so that they can go after some money for things that are going on in their community, sometimes at their own initiatives, or maybe it's something to help with a, a project that, that's, you know, combined by a lot of people. So, yes, I, I'm finding I'm very much on a positive note to wind up this meeting and all power to their elbows. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Councillor McDonald, please. Yes, I too um, would echo what uh, Lavina said about um, this programme. There, there may be um, in, in the future, if we are successful, a new name for it. I would hope that um, that, that we wouldn't trip on the, the tongue so much. But um, I, my, my question, I suppose, and I think there are positives, even if we if we're not successful, I can see and feel throughout the report that, that you know that this type of working is is just is just the way to go. But I did my question, I suppose, is, is it is it all or none? or is there um is there is there an opportunity or is there any um was was there any, anything mooted that there might be some some of it that would be supported but not all so um I, I, that's really my question I, I think uh councillor mcdonald thank you for for your support first of all i, I mean i think formally and, and i probably defer to to pete more of the expert on this this world but my understanding is this is a pot of funding and the application is for, for, for that, and it's pretty brutal. You either win or you, you don't. However, I would hope that if we were unsuccessful, that we would be able to kind of go back and have some conversation, at the very least to get feedback on on our on our bid. But but there's constantly sources of, of funding that you can bid for from both the NIHR and a whole load of other sources of of research, and I think now that we Absolutely. understand the um, the process of pulling these kind of things to, together, because it's been a big learning curve for, for for us from an ACC point of view, we would be much much slicker in, in in doing that. But I think we'll keep our fingers crossed that we are we are successful, and and, and you'd like to think that given we're the only Scottish authority that we would have a kind of good a good chance but but yes thank you for for your support we're happy to keep you updated thank you very much for that i, I had you lavina was that an historical hand or it was a historical hand yes i i'm just sitting here so chuffed that that you know there's so and and the, the, i think it's ian stewart it, it was at the last meeting when Jenny Lane's last cheering, that that uh, I brought up the issue of of this funding tracker, the fund tracker, uh, that we used to get information about, and then it's disappeared. But I'm not surprised that that happened through COVID and Brexit and God knows what else has been going on. So now that that if they haven't can't get it from one fund, maybe they'll be able to get it from another or even have to add bits and pieces together from other funding in order to get this wonderful project underway. Thank you very much for that. Mr Edwards, thanks. Um, thank you, convener. Um, so, so just to confirm Mrs Scott's um, suspicions, I'm afraid having been in the, the research funding game for the last 25 years, um, even when you get to the interview stage, it doesn't guarantee you get any money at all, I'm afraid. And I've been in that chair, and I've I've uh, I've had the dear applicant letter, and we we regretfully inform you. So I really really hope on this occasion it's positive, and I, and I just wanted to say um, again, e echoing what Mrs Scott said, that I think this has been a really excellent example. I think of the local authority and the higher education sector in the northeast coming together. I think we all hope it is successful. If it isn't, there's a huge amount of learning, and there's a huge amount of network building that's happened as a, as a result of the bid process and there are other sources of funding both within scotland and the rest of the uk so i think you know we can build on it i think the other observation i'd make is that i think although people perhaps may not like the name hdrc 
I would just draw the board's attention to the C, which is collaboration. And one of the things that's expected from NI NIHR if, if, if we are successful is that collaboration means over the life of, of, of the funding, both strategic and operational alignment between what the council wants to do and what the universities do. And it's about aligning the program of work so that it meets the requirements of community planning Aberdeen, but it also delivers against the research that our researchers want to do. And then in operational delivery, it's about making sure we deliver impact. And, and that, that really, I think the collaboration part should not really can't be overstated. You know, it will be a true collaboration. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I, I have to say I'm a glass half full person. I'm confident, hopefully, that we will get there. Um, and it, because I think it is a really, really, really good uh, piece of work and I think it's a really good report. Um, so hopefully I'll be correct. Um, I'll be very disappointed if I'm not. <laughs> um, but if there are no further questions, is there any further questions or comments? If not, then we will note the recommendation in the report, please. Can we agree? And we'll call an end to the meeting. Thank you very much for attending and we'll hopefully see you uh, in the next wee while. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks. <laughs>